Babel doing a fine job on him. Babel, one of the top defensive players that can play that swing position in the country. Kettner draws the foul on Luchtefeld. So St. Louis with the early edge here. Billy, we were talking yesterday at practice about this matchup looking very even going in, huh? It is, Jim. There's two things that jump out at you, and that is that Massachusetts has a 5.7 rebound advantage over their opponents. St. Louis, a minus 4.5, which is very unusual, but they make it up because in the turnover margin, St. Louis is 4-4 to the positive and Massachusetts 1-3 to the negative. Two uh, very tough defensive teams. Kentucky with an 82-67 win over South Carolina State advancing. The only non-nail-biter so far today. A one, a two, and a three-point game we've seen in opening round action on this Friday. What a wild sequence we saw just a few moments ago with Valpo, Western Michigan, both pulling upsets, Syracuse winning with a second Final remaining. Four, Jim Nance and Billy Packer back here with you in Atlanta. What do you make of all this wild play we've seen in the tournament, both yesterday and today in the first round? Well, Jim, we didn't see a great game, but we saw, I thought, South Carolina State in the first game today show what a coach can do with a group of kids and making them to believe. And that's part of what this tournament's about also. Mumu Blakeney putting on a terrific job in the backcourt. And, and I, I love that. You know, they wonder, why is everybody get in? Maybe they won't all be nail biters, but that was an Excellent display by a team that obviously was overwhelmed personnel-wise. Well, in this game we're going to see today, in the second game of our quadruple header here in Atlanta, Larry Hughes. There he is, the freshman averaging over 21 a game for the Billikens. What do you make out of uh, his game so far? Well, Not I just saw, today, but what you've seen all season. Yeah, I saw Larry for the first time last year when we had him on CBS in the Nike Hoop Summit. Uh, I, I didn't know him before that time, although he'd been played on the AAU National Championship team. But he showed me then, I thought that he was the best-looking prospect of all anybody in the country. And he certainly didn't uh, do anything but to... Uh, uh, put the earmark on that or the stamp of approval on that this year. A terrific job in his part. Conference USA Freshman of the Year. Both of these teams with 21 and 10 records. Larry Kettner, the center for Massachusetts at 6'10 and just looking at him out on the floor with all the rest of the players. Tremendous size advantage in this game today. Well, he is. He's a power player. All-Atlantic 10 this year. Terrific shot blocker and you can see right there in terms of his scoring ability, uh, particularly down the stretch, he has been outstanding for UMass. UMass coached by Bruiser Flint in his second year. The fourth youngest Division I head coach at 32. His team was 12-4 and four in conference. Again, 21-10 and 10 overall. St. Louis directed by Charlie Spoonhour in his sixth year with the Billikens. Again, we have some tip times now all set for our second sequence of games. Butler in New Mexico. If you're getting that game, we'll send you out to the tip shortly. Also, College of Charleston and Stanford in the Midwest or Florida State at TCU. There's Bruiser Flint. 40 and 24 record in two seasons it's replacing John Calipari. It's kind of interesting they started 8-0 in the conference this year. That's the fourth time that UMass has started in Atlantic 10, 8-0 in the conference. And of course it caught up to them a little bit this year. Did not win the regular season. But it is a tough defensive basketball team. Backdoor cut set up for beautifully by Hughes. Luchtefeld with the bounce pass in there. And there's Charlie Spoonhour. He was always a tough out before at Southwest Missouri, West Missouri State. In fact, beat Clemson for his first NCAA tournament win right here in Atlanta. And the Tigers certainly smarting today after Western Michigan eliminated them. The state of South Carolina not in too good a shape, Jim. South Carolina State, Clemson, and uh, South Carolina. College of Charleston will now try to carry the state pride but a big underdog against Stanford. A little shaky ball handling in the backcourt. Weeks normally will help against good pressure and a deep from the uh, offensive end, helping the guards bring the ball up the court. They don't really have a true point guard in Clark or Max. There's Kettner. Ooh. Really slammed it off the glass. He really did. Use that upper body strength to gain himself some room. Both teams make 
making substitutions early. Right back to Luxefeld. He was lucky there. He tried to throw the ball right through Weeks' arms. Here's Larry Hughes. Had a 40-point game this year against Marquette. Another talented freshman, Bonyak, center, number 30. Here's Coppin, three-point try. He likes to do, shoot that three-pointer from the standstill. Coppin's hit two jumpers, one of three. We saw Tyler Brown in the first game for South Carolina State like to shoot that standstill jumper. He's got to get out on him, make him put the ball on the floor. Boy, Weeks set a vicious, a vicious screen up top. Kirkland driving. Well done, using his body to help launch that shot. John Redden, number 12, in for St. Louis. Kirkland now over there guarding Hughes. Second time he's been taken back door by Hughes. Good pickup from the weak side. The Minutemen out of Amherst. Seven of eight NCAA tournament appearances in the 1990s. Last year knocked out in the first round by Louisville, but two years ago made it all the way to the Final Four against Kentucky. And could face Kentucky in the second round if they advance today. They would face Kentucky if they won today. Both teams going to the bench early here. Larry Hughes sitting down without a field goal. Averages 32 minutes a game. Luxafell left open. And Clark sweeps it away for the Minutemen. He faded away on the shot. Bassett doing a pretty good job coming right at him. Heinrich and Bassett down inside. A lot of bodies there. Weeks with the board. Turnaround flip. Coppin pulls it away. Weeks with a twisted left ankle, not playing at 100%. Matter of fact, he's got a special cast that he's got on that ankle. He did not play the first game in the Atlantic 10, sat out against Virginia Tech in only 13 minutes against GW in their loss. Down in there on Heinrich. Bassett and ripped away. Second good defensive play by Bassett on the inside. Bassett, good shot for two, comes in off the bench, 6'9", sophomore, Luck from Brooklyn. Luckenfeld having a hard time with the bodying of Bassett on the inside and Kettner before that. Giving up probably uh, 20 pounds or so against both of those guys. Jamal Walker gives it up to Cobbin, who's off to a good start. 12-9 UMass. Nice judgment by Walker. Good pass. Heinrich. We're seeing some unusual low post play here from fellows that we didn't expect to be the big scorers in this game, Jim. And again, Larry Hughes sits on the bench now. He's called a check in at the scorer's table. That's foul called on John Redden, 12-11 UMass, early action. Stern still looking for his first points, averages 21 a game. And Depina in the ball game now to run things for Massachusetts. First time we see St. Louis back in the zone on the timeout situation. Hughes without a field goal so far to get past it. Hughes giving up the shot. This team has really been well scouted. They know where to shade. Paul Lewis picked up by St. Louis. Ahead Defender to Hughes. Defender against a great offensive play. Put up with an end by Banyak. Yes. Hughes now 0 for 4 from the field. Missed the lay-in. Babel was trying to defend. He really did a good job getting back there, Jimmy. He was beat. I thought Hughes should go for the dunk on that play and try to draw the foul. And there you see the 2-3 zone. Hughes really shading over, giving up anything Bassett wants to take out here. Zapina doesn't want to shoot the jumper either. Called for traveling. So Babel defending Hughes. Misses the chippy, but Banyak follows up for the slam. You see the pass down here. Now here's where Hughes realized that Babel was behind him. Probably should have gone right directly at the basket for the dunk. 
Greening on the inside. Heinrich has one little half hook. Money Mack, blocked by Robertson. Back to Babel. Nice job by Heinrich going down on the floor. And he got possession. They have the arrow. The Billikens 21 and 10, 11 and 5 this year in conference play. Their first NCAA appearance since 1995. They defeated Minnesota that year in the first round in overtime, then lost to the number one seed in the East, Wake Forest, only down by five, lost by five. Then their losses this year to UCLA, Syracuse, Arkansas, a couple to Cincinnati. So they played a very difficult schedule both in and out of conference. screen for Hughes coming out. Table does a good job realizing what's going to happen. Good dish. Banyak. Off to a good start. That's his third field goal. Excellent pass by Luckenfeld. Boy, Kettner is so strong in there. That's it, and they take it away. They call him for the charge. Well, Jim, we uh, we saw the clear out by Bassett and by Kettner. Here's the pass on the inside by Luchtenfeld. Good job by Banyak to hold his man off. But what we saw are the low post players using that shoulder to clear space. That time the foul was called. Craig Gumbel in New York, three-point lead for St. Louis over UMass, and those of you awaiting the action in Chicago, it is your time. We'll get you set for the College of Charleston against the Stanford Cardinal, Tim Ryan and Dan Bonner at the United Center. The United Center in Chicago, ready now for the number 14 seeds, College of Charleston's Cougars, against the number three seeds, the Cardinal of Stanford, with a record of 26 and four. Well, we've had one upset here today. Western Michigan's Broncos knocking off Clemson and a real thriller that went down to the wire. Tonight, it'll be St. John's in Detroit and the number two seeds, Purdue against number 15, Delaware. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim Ryan with Dan Bonner back here. It'll be hard to top the action we had there. All the thrills <laughs> of that first game with Western Michigan's upset of Clemson. Stanford, one of the uh, top teams in the country uh, all season long, got out to an 18-0 start. They scored 80 points a game, big up front and solid in the backcourt. Everybody talks about Stanford's size, but they do score a lot of points. The catalyst, Tim, are the guys in the backcourt, the little guys. Art Lee on your left, Chris Weems on your right, a couple of juniors who really get it done in the backcourt. These guys are each among the top ten all-time in Stanford three-point shooting. Well, the winners of the Transamerica Conference regular season the tournament, College of Charleston. Last year, they upset Maryland in the first round. This, this time, a little bit different team. They do it on defense. Yeah, Tim, that's right. Anybody that watched the tournament last year knows the name, the College of Charleston, but a defensive-oriented rather than an offensive-oriented team. 55 points a game in the top 10 field goal percentage. 11 steals a game. They're going to have to get those because they're going to need steals that convert to easy baskets. Uh, they're outstanding coach John Kress in his 19th season he'll take his team into the Southern Conference next year and his lineup is led by the outstanding junior from Columbia Cedric Weber number 23 and Carl Thomas and Carlos Brown will be up front with Shane McCravey and Jermel President a good three-point shooter in the backcourt Mike Montgomery in his 12th season as head coach at Stanford he thinks this might be the best lineup he has ever had at Stanford and it is big it is strong and it is deep Madsen sour and big seven foot one Tim Young up front we mentioned they're very solid experienced backcourt a pair of juniors in Weems and Lee well the Crest twins are here Ryan and John don't ask me which is which I get <laughs> to figure that out but uh, they're here along with mom to cheer on dad and their Carl their College of Charleston team in fact, uh, during practices, you can see their ball handling ability. They've become pretty good little dribblers. Tim, and yeah, I can't blame you if you can't tell them apart. We asked John Cress yesterday which one was rich, and they were across the court, and he said, I can't tell. I have to be closer <laughs> to him. Well, he's got his family, his fans here, and John Cress, 19 years in Charleston, 
Presently in the Trans-America Athletic Conference, moving to the Southern, as we said, 11,000 students there in that fine college of Charleston. 24 and 5, they come in here. They won both regular season and conference tournament championships. Third time in, second in a row. Knocking off Maryland a year ago before losing to the eventual winner, Arizona. Rusty Herring, Edwin Edsall, and Glenn Mayborg are the officials. Stanford wearing white. College of Charleston in their maroon jerseys. And we are underway. Game two here from the United Center and Stanford controls. Madsen, Sauer, and Young up front. Weems and Arthur Lee. This is Chris Weems. Charleston starts in the man-to-man -man defense. Weems. Rebounded by Young. Young goes hard to the board. Tip in try by Sauer. Misses. And Charleston comes down with it. Good effort by Carlos Brown. Well, they're not going to want to give Stanford three shots at it every time, Tim, but they did a nice job rebounding the ball. Carl Thomas opens the scoring. And right away, even though Stanford's the taller team, John Kress elects with his first offensive play to take the ball right inside. Tim Young, and again, blasting the boards, gets it back again. This time he makes it. Well, Stanford early is piling up their offensive rebound stats. Tim, big and strong inside. They got they have three offensive rebounds in their first two possessions, and they were able to convert that time. Man-to-man -man for Stanford. Tim Young, the junior from Santa Cruz, California, averages 11-3 a game. Carl Thomas outside off of Carlos Brown. Now that's an interesting matchup right there. Tim Young against Carlos Brown. Brown at about six feet four. They would like him to drive past Young to the basket. We talked with John Crest yesterday, and he said he was in hopes that if Young matched up against Brown, Brown would be able to take him to the goal from the perimeter. Thomas at 6'7", Weber at 6'6", the tallest of the Charleston players, and that, of course, is a problem coming into this game. They are small against this very large Stanford Cardinal team. Well, we talk about the great size of Stanford, but here the great size is on the outside. Seven foot one, Tim Young, passing it inside to six foot three, Chris Weems against Shane McGravy in there. Does a nice job catching the ball and getting it to the basket quickly. McGravy picks up his first personal chance for three points for Weems, and he connects. 5-2, Stanford early lead. Just underway here at the United Center in game two, Western Michigan, ousting Clemson from the tournament with an upset victory earlier. This is McCravey, the junior from Spartanburg, South Carolina. Ball whipped inside for Cedric Weber. His turnaround off the back iron. Rebounded by Jamel President. And now here's the 2-2-1 press. And this defense set by John Press has been very effective for them all season long, just surrendering 55 points a game as they roll up a 24 and 5 mark. Well, that press is actually the same one used by the University of Connecticut. Madsen gets inside and scores two, and of course, UConn really beat up on Stanford a couple of weeks ago. Ability. They lost Thaddeus Delaney and Anthony Johnson along with two other starters. They're all in pro basketball. Uh, Johnson, of course, has started with the Kings in the NBA. And rebound by the big man, Madsen. Lee quickly up court. Weems inside. And over the top comes Cedric Weber picking up his first personal. We mentioned the size of Stanford. Madsen on the inside really does a nice job working for position. Just knocks Carlos Brown out of the way and takes the ball up to the basket. Well, you man. And that is Sauer. Well, now you're Sauer connecting. Now you're getting a chance to see the inside outside. We showed you that replay Stanford scoring on the inside. Sauer, one of five guys on Stanford's team to score 37 or more three point baskets this season. He shoots him at 42%. He's a big guy for lofting him out there. Six foot seven. Ah! Missed by Carlos Brown. Rebounded by Stanford. Here comes Weems. Pull up jumper off the glass. Won't drop. But there's the rebound again. Madsen. Madsen sticks with it. 
I'm telling you, that's some hard work right there, but some good quickness by Madsen. He was down underneath the basket. What a great job to run the floor and get himself in position for that rebound. Eight-point lead for Stanford. Four points for Madsen, the sophomore from Danville, California. A gravy's pass just off the mark intended for Carlos Brown. It was open. One of the things that's occurred early in the game is Stanford really has been able to use their inside strength. Madsen gets the first one blocked, but then he gets the second one to go. Another offensive rebound. Five now in the game, and it's really early. Weems pass off target, try to get it to Sauer, cutting through the lane. Good position defense that time by Charleston. And Brown goes out, and Mark Himes comes in for John Cress's troops. Mark Himes, a junior from Columbia, South Carolina, off the bench, averaging 5.4 points a game. Mel President. Out for Carl Thomas. McCravey, McCravey's alley. You play is good. Cedric Weber up for it. <laughs> That's a pretty interesting innovation. You try to throw the alley-oop against a tall, tall lineup, and you're successful. Cole Player of the Year in the Tech Tournament and for the regular season. Cedric Weber. Charleston back in his zone. They drop back into the zone after they do the press. Oh, boy, that's a long three. Three-pointer for Sauer, his second of those six points, 15 to six to Stanford lead. And Charleston, I think they got half their bench trained that every time Stanford has the ball, Tim, to just shout three seconds because that's what they did that entire possession. President gets it back. President for two. Boy, what a nice job creating some space so he could get the shot off. He's got four points. Charleston pressing again. Stanford ranked number 10 in the country, the number three seeds here in the Midwest. Their seventh NCAA appearance. Last year losing to Utah in the third round, Sweet 16. And Charleston really needs to get turnovers like that with their press and then turn them into baskets on the other end. Thomas started his drive, set it off for President, and from the corner it's Weber up checking. Himes, Mark Himes with a, a two-pointer, his first basket of the game. Charleston does not really rely on the three very heavily in its offense. Nice catch. Young foul before he got his pass off to Madsen. And that will be on Mark Himes with 14.25 to go in the half. Stanford by five. 21 tie, St. Louis and UMass will keep you updated on this game via the top part of your screen and we'll take you to Lexington, Kentucky to show you what's happening between Butler and New Mexico almost halfway through the first half, only a 13-7 game, very slow pace. Who does that favor, Clark? Butler, big time, Greg. They want to control tempo. They want to control pace. They run a very deliberate motion game offensively. They want to make you work defensively and use that shot clock to their advantage. New Mexico just 3 of 10 shooting from the floor early on. They're missing Royce only, but Butler 5 out of 10 from the floor, and they have the early lead at 13 to 7. Meanwhile, in Chicago, United Center, College of Charleston and Stanford underway a short while ago. This is a 15-12 lead for the Cardinals. Stanford has tremendous size and depth. They want to make sure they take advantage of that by controlling pace. They don't mind playing in the 70s, low 80s, but really with their size advantage, they want to try to get Tim Young off early and often. South Carolina, South Carolina State, Clemson have all lost so far. The College of Charleston would really like to keep the whole state from being swept out of the tournament in the first round. Well, they've got enough team speed. They, that means they can defend, be scrappy, maybe come up with steals, force turnovers, and then obviously they've got to shoot it well especially on the perimeter because they might not be able to get a lot of stuff inside today. All right, Clark. Meanwhile, in Oklahoma City, Florida State and TCU. That game uh, just a couple of minutes into the first half and Texas Christian with a two-point lead. And much of this will depend, as you said earlier, on which Florida State team shows today. Well, if they're good, in good health, and it seems like they are, their key people are healthy. And I think they're playing with a lot to prove because they didn't even think they were going to get into the tournament. Now they can prove they belong by beating a very hot and, and outstanding scoring team in Texas Christian. 
TCU four of five from the field early on. We will update everything for you coming up at halftime. Right now, let's take you back to Atlanta, St. Louis, and UMass. UMass foul at number 34, Tyrell Wake. That's his first. St. Louis with the lead, 23-21. Shooting a one and one. There have been six lead changes and four ties in this game with both teams coming in. Identical records, 21 and 10. Charlie Schoonauer. Sixth year at St. Louis. Memorable past performances as an underdog at Southwest Missouri State. Well, he won championships there in the 87, 88, 89, and 90. Took his team to multiple NCAA. There's Banyaka again. Multiple NCAA tournaments for Charlie Schoonauer. One of the real neat guys in college coaching. A lot of fun. And obviously, you can get some guys to play some defense. Cobbin whistled for that reach in. Did you hear that uh, referee made a comment? He said, too much. And, and I, a, a real and neat call and, and good perception on the part of the referee. He's allowing some, some body out there, but when there's a little bit too much aggressiveness, he made the good call. Larry Hughes comes back in, still without a shot from the floor dropping. He comes in and probably says, I hope number 23 is sitting down when I get back in here. <laughs> Tired of looking at him. Yeah, well, he's... Uh, but he isn't. <laughs> no, he's still in there. Hughes 0 for 5 from the field. Three free throws. You can see doubling down on Kettner anytime he gets the ball inside. Weeks muscles it up. He'll go to the line for two. Coming up, Pennzoil at the half. Back to New York we go. Greg Clark and Coach Smith will wheel us around the country, look at some of the other action, and keep us abreast of all the stories. It's already an electrifying start to the second day of the NCAA tournament. Jim, the way this game is going, it looks like we may finally have one of those uh, ourselves here coming down to the wire. One of the things that you can see is what St. Louis U has decided to do anytime Kettner touches the ball. They're doubling and tripling down inside on him and going to make him catch and throw the ball back outside. Kettner would be smart to just catch and fire immediately and get the ball back in on the second pass. Weeks with eight rebounds, six of them on the offensive end. Eight rebounds in a game where he didn't even know if he was going to play about two hours ago. Terrific job by a young man who's already gotten his degree. Those uh, formulas, the Prop 48, so he became a Prop 68. The guy that proved he could not only play basketball, get his degree, and got the extra year back. Another good defensive play by Babel. And Hughes really forced that he shot. He really did. So he said he didn't want to see number 23 back out there. Isn't that uh, another guy had the number 23? That's a pretty good defender. I think so. I think <laughs> I'm, I'm, I have an idea who you're talking about. Well, I'll tell you one thing. In Atlanta, Georgia, that number 23 in college faced one of his most disappointing moments. Michael Jordan, not on this floor, but uh, ended his uh, college career. He lost to Indiana. Kettner has two players around him. And a whistle called on Cobbin for too tight again on the defending. There was the double down inside Cobbin. Anytime that ball goes in the low post to Kettner, they are really dropping on him. Heinrich, a uh, very strong young man himself. Charlie Spoonauer's got his program in pretty nice shape when you take in consideration. Lack of seniors. He's got some size in these uh, freshman and sophomore class. He's trying to work the referees a little bit on the sideline, showing his displeasure with touch fouls inside. Robertson back for St. Louis. Ryan Robertson's younger brother, Kansas's guard. DePina also back for the Minutemen. Robertson uh, right next to Weeks. Weeks is going to push him right underneath the basket and does. Robertson better plant himself a little stronger than that if he's going to step up against Weeks. Minute and a half to go in the first half. Biggest lead by either side in this game. Three. That's all. Weeks ball. tries to save it. St. Louis ball. Ball smothered by Kettner and Weeks. Weeks a terrific leader on this basketball team. He played against uh, St. Louis U when Mass played in St. Louis and beat them. That had been three years ago, right? Three seasons ago? The biggest crowd that uh, St. Louis has ever had at the Keel Center. Had uh, Lou Rowe with 22,000 on hand, but that right. can be missed the game. Right. Camby didn't play. Lou Rowe took over. Heinrich. 
Oh, misses the lay-in, and Babel on the floor for the loose ball. The Pina comes out. Heinrich had to finish that one strong, tried to put it up on the glass. Heinrich ahead to Hughes. Uh -oh. Still have a chance to get his first field goal. Hughes scores off the glass. And with 54 seconds to go, Hughes get his first field goal, but he's limping badly coming down the court. I don't know if it's an ankle or he just got banged on the knee. Game all tied at 25. Well, in this NCAA tournament, the ones and twos have advanced so far, but there has been a victim at a three seed, South Carolina losing to Richmond, and a four seed in Ole Miss going down today. So we two have sixes, six. Billy. Yeah. That was your number. Remember that on the selection well, show? I said, I said the two most dangerous teams as far as if you're looking for dark horses would be Xavier and Clemson. Now, both of them are now home. Uh, you know, you never know. And I'm, I'm the worst, Jim, as you know, at trying to pick anything for this tournament. But well, you uh, said they were upset specialists. Yeah, that's right. I think you meant <laughs> maybe you no, meant no, the other way. No, 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 no. I'm not backing off. I was wrong. 40 seconds to go and a 20 called by Schoonauer's side. Charlie's got it 25-25. Exactly what he'd like to do is keep his team close. And he wants to make sure he gets off a good shot now. He told me yesterday, if at the 10 minute mark, at, in the first half, if we have not committed a lot of fouls, I think it can be our day. Other, other side of the only way we can stop them, man, a lot of calls against us. That is, I, I just don't think we're gonna have a chance. But 10 I, minutes into this game, they committed only three fouls. And Jim, I think part of his thinking right there was that, and you know, it, it hurts him right now, the last 25 or 39 seconds, not to have Hughes on the floor. Hughes uh, looked like he turned his ankle a little bit, so he doesn't have his number one go-to guy to go to set up this last shot. It's about five-second differential on the clock. Banyak not in the game either. He has been basically the guy that carried the load offensively. Who's going to get this shot? Heinrich with five on the shot clock. Corey Frazier, he's stuck two on the shot clock. Just got to throw it up. Top it goes! And it counts <laughs> just for St. Like, Louis. Just for the like lead. Charlie diagrammed it. Clark to beat the buzzer. Count, no! In and out. What a wild first half, and that no side led by more than three. They both enjoyed a three-point lead at one time. St. Louis leads at the intermission, 27-25 in CBS Sports. Exclusive coverage of the NCAA Men's Basketball Championship will continue after this message and a word from your local station. Backcourt players in particular are going to have to be aware of the fact that even though Charleston is not a great shot-blocking team, it's going to be hard to get all the way to the basket. They move their feet well on defense. If you just figure you're going all the way to the goal, you might get a charge. Brown goes out. Weber returns for Charleston. Three-point try missed by Derrico White. Into the lineup at guard for Charleston as well. And that shot by Weber hit the side of the backboard. Both teams substituting freely here with 8.58 to go first half. Quickly now for the Stanford Cardinal again. They've got Ryan Mendez in the lineup. Lee, Mosley, and Jerron Collins also in number 31. His first appearance along with Van Elswick. This is Mosley in the paint. Boy, Jaron Collins doing a great job wrestling that ball away from McCravey. Now what do we got? We got three second violations. And we said that the College of Charleston bench, every time Stanford comes down the court, they start hollering three seconds, and they keep it up <laughs> until the, they get the ball. That's six turnovers by the normally disciplined Stanford team. Charleston only has committed one of those. In the corner, this is White. Now, one of the problems that Charleston has had all year long, Kim, is they tend to go through six or seven minute stretches where they simply can't score. And they appear to be in the middle of one of those stretches right now. Carl Thomas with a miss. Lee back quickly for the Cardinal. That's great quickness by Dorico White. Really prevents Lee from penetrating to the basket. Now in the man-to-man, -man, McCravey's going to pick him up. Charleston has missed their last nine field goal tries. Stanford in possession, tied at 19. 
That one tipped out of bounds. And we'll take this time out, 7.56 to go, tied at 19. Chicago, and we'll fill you in on all of it. Coming right up. CBS Sports presents Pennzoil at the Half. Sponsored by Pennzoil. Specially formulated for today's stop and go driving. Stop, go, Pennzoil. Welcome once again to Pennzoil at the Half, everyone. Along with Dean Smith and Clark Kellogg, I'm Greg Gumbel. We are at halftime of our game between UMass and St. Louis. The Billikens are leading it by a score of 27 to 25. When I say that, Coach, are you shocked? Not really, because UMass does like a faster game, so St. Louis is winning that. It's 27 to 25, except we don't know how badly Hughes could be hurt. I think that's a big question, and whether St. Louis can keep it up. Clark. They're shooting the ball well. UMass has dominated the glass, haven't taken advantage of that, but over time, that advantage on the boards could end up being the difference in the game. All right, Clark, uh, let's uh, check in on action elsewhere now at Rupp Arena in Lexington. First round action in the South, Butler and New Mexico. It's the Lobos by three. Let's join Tim Brando and Al McGuire. The Duke of it, not this time, follows his own shot. Von Ryan trying to keep it alive and finally corralled by Lamont Long. New Mexico claiming only its second lead of the game in the midst of a 7-0 run here at Rupp Arena. And Shields can't hit. Now Frazier on the loose. Full dog starts a big ball at that time. When Ryan could be trouble for you if he get off his feet. He doesn't rebound, he reaches. He doesn't get off his feet, doesn't jump. Newhauser getting a bit of a blow, so the options offensively come down quite a bit when Newhauser is on the bench. New Mexico taking advantage. Marshall clears. Well, Lamont Long has missed a couple of layups today. I don't know why that time he just didn't go in for the dunk. There's nobody in front of him. Well, Billy Tubbs and TCU right with Florida State. College of Charleston much the same with Stanford. Uh, uh, every game seemingly a wire job from the two seed to the fifth seed matching up against the lower seeded teams today and the Kentuckian Jeff Rogers pulls Butler to within one. Playing the college of Charleston is like getting root canal. Henry we need him to shoot the ball a bit more. Shields rejected. Very close to goal pending. Frazier swatted it away. And it's pulled down. So now a one-point lead for New Mexico, and the winner of this game moves on to play Syracuse at the United Center in Chicago. First-round action in the Midwest College of Charleston against Stanford. They're tied at 19. Tim Ryan and Dan Bonner with a live call. College of Charleston, the number 14 seeds. Their third NCAA tournament appearance. And... The number three seeds from Stanford, the Cardinal, ranked number 10 in the country with their 26-4 mark, averaging 80 points a game. At the line is Cedric Weber. They haven't been able to get him on track as yet. The junior from Columbia, South Carolina. He has four points, averaging 15. Earlier today, a thrilling upset. Western Michigan, number 11 seed in the Midwest over Clemson. And uh, they had to... Come back from a 12-point lead they had at halftime. They fell down by six and battled against the tough Tigers to win that one. Tim, this game so far has been a battle of strength. Stanford has really been strong on the inside. Offensive rebound scoring effectively in the low post. Charleston has created steals and baskets with its defense. Lee bumped by Jamal President. First on him. College of Charleston with a one-point lead on the Cardinal as they approach seven and a half minutes to play in the first half. In Oklahoma City, first round action in the Midwest, 12th seeded Florida State Seminoles, one-point lead on TCU. Ted Robinson and Rolando Blackman are there. So in Oklahoma City, Florida State, the 12th seed in gold. And they're playing right now with TCU, the fifth seed wearing white. 22-21 Florida State. And basically what 
most people who've seen Florida State play this year felt was that if they could win and rebound from the terrible stretch they had been through in February and early March, it was to win in the type of game that TCU excelled at. Up-tempo, was playing the highest scoring team in the country in TCU at 97 points a game. And so far, Florida State's playing well with Orlando in this game. And right now, they're handling the pressure, which is very, very important right now on TCU's traps and pressures that they're using in the front court. They're Florida State is sending out runners right now, and they're able to break down that pressure by getting some easy baskets and getting Lee Mail and basically into foul trouble, too. So it's a one-point game, Florida State leading TCU. You know, there were four one-point games in 63 games last year. We've already had four in the tournament this year. Valparaiso by one over Ole Miss, 69-67 Mississippi Valpo coach. Homer Drew looking for a miracle. It's to Jenkins, to Drew for the win! Good! He did it! A miracle! It's a play bet that we run over and over in practice constantly, and Usually never a season do you have a chance to run it. We call it Pacer because we kind of learned it from the Indianapolis Pacer years ago. So it is a set play, and Jamie Sykes made a great pass. Bill Jenkins made a great catch, and in a good pass, and then Bryce, what an awesome shot. Uh, you know, just very proud for our team. How many times have you and Bryce played out that very scenario in the backyard? We do have a court in the backyard, and we have hit that shot over and over again. It was just wonderful to see Bryce finally get to show everyone else that he can hit that shot. Our congratulations, Homer. Best of luck in the second round. Thanks very much, Beth. You know, Coach, that has to be a special moment for a coach. What an extra special moment for a dad. That dad and his son coming through like that, but the, the dad did a heck of a job to have that play. It had to be a great pass twice, a good catch, but his son Bryce, whom he taught to shoot, made it. All right, Coach, in Lexington, Syracuse prevailed over Iona 63-61 to at Rupp Arena. Syracuse cheerleaders on hand. Everybody looking forward to this game. Under 30 seconds to play in regulation. The Gales down two. Senior John McDonald. Donald in traffic throws up a three that falls and it led to these final seconds. Rejected by Hamid. Three seconds left. You're Mullis. You gotta know where he is. Iona played a great game. They outplayed us. We were a little lucky to win, but in this tournament, once in a while you get one lucky break and maybe you take advantage of it. Maybe that'll help us someplace ahead. Shades of the Syracuse Orange Men two years ago in Denver against Georgia. Clark? Jason Coppola knocked one down, and in my playing days, I knocked down a couple of game winners. Never in the tournament, but nonetheless, there's no greater rush when you're a player than knocking down a game winner. All right, Clark, we have more action coming up. Second half action from Atlanta still to come as we continue down the road to the Final Four. Don't go away. Pennzoil at the half has been sponsored by Pennzoil, specially formulated for today's stop-and-go driving. Stop, go, Pennzoil. Four-point lead, 3.47 to go here in the first half, and uh, tomorrow there should be some interesting action again out of the east in Washington, D.C. Richmond, an upset winner yesterday, takes on Washington, who knocked off the six-seeded Xavier. You'll also see Indiana against Connecticut, starting at approximately 4.38. And how about PM those Richmond Spiders? For the fifth time, they upset, when they're in the tournament as a number 12 or lower seed, they upset a higher-seeded team. Just, a, you know, that's <laughs> just an incredible... Uh, you saw Richmond uh, in your bracket. You'd be, particularly if you're in the first round, you would be very disinterested. Don't want to see him. Nope. This is Ween. Driving around McCravey, but missing the basket, and up to rebound is Carl Thomas. Charleston is one of 15 from the field. Their last 15 tries have made only one. They've got to get something going offensively. They're lucky to be within four, and they do. That is Carl Thomas. John Press told us that Charleston goes through six and seven minute stretches where they can't score. Seven points for Thomas, one point gain. And I think John Press hopes that the first stretch like that is done and maybe be the only one in this game. Donald still in the ball game at guard for Stanford. His pass knocked out of bounds by Himes. Himes has been very active both ends of the court. Coming off the bench early for Charleston. Been a very effective player for them. Good quick hands, good quick feet. Sauer. Pull up is short, an air ball, but the big man is there, Madsen, to convert. 
Hudson does a great job getting position. You know, to be a good rebounder, you sort of have to have a sense of where the ball is going to come off, and Madsen seems to have that. Gravy for Thomas, out to Himes. This is McGravy again, Shane McGravy. President stumbled, and he's called for traveling. 228 remains here at the United Center. Stanford up by three over the College of Charleston. Charleston upsetting Maryland last year, then giving Arizona a tough battle. The eventual champions finally stopping Charleston's run in just their second appearance in the NCAA tournament. This is number three. Weems, air ball. Charleston defense this entire game has forced Stanford into some tough opportunities, but on the other side of the coin, Charleston hasn't been able to convert as effectively on offense as they might like. Lee comes right back the other way. He got his. President went the distance and missed, and President hasn't been able to get off the mark. He averages 10.5 points a game. Weems makes the score 32-27, to 27, back to a five-point lead. Earlier today, Western Michigan, the 11 seeds in the Midwest, ousting Clemson, the number six seeds. And, of course, uh, the Broncos waiting the winner of this one, Stanford and College of Charleston. Tonight, St. John's in Detroit, seven against ten. And the number two seeds in the Midwest, the Boilermakers of Purdue, will take on the fighting Blue Hens at Delaware, those two this evening here in Chicago. 153 remains. Stanford by five, 32 to 27. John Kress got to feel pretty good that he's as close as he is, Dan Bonner, because uh, shooting a two of 16 from the field, his last 16 tries from the field, uh, he's lucky to be close. Well, it's the story of the game so far, Tim, has been that Charleston defense has done a nice job holding in check a very potent Stanford offense, but the Charleston offense, not real good decisions sometimes. There's another bad one on the turnover that they can't score offensively. Sauer picking off the pass from McCravey. That is Arthur Lee with a three. And see, the risk you run against a team like Stanford, you're just not going to keep them down the entire half or the entire game. They are going to get some points, so you've got to make sure that your offense is efficient. Danny Johnson in the corner. Stanford looks like they've stepped it up intensity-wise on the defensive end. Cardinal scores 81 points a game. They've got 35 here with 105 to go in the half, so Charleston holding them below their average if you look at it by halves. Coming up on the Pennzoil at the half, Ray Gubble will be along with Mark Kellogg and Dean Smith. So join us there to get caught up on all of the other activity going on around the nation in the NCAA road to the Final Four here on CBS. 105 remains with Weber at the line. Seaton picked up his first personal to send him there. Weber gets one to reduce the eight-point margin. Weber, 69.5% from the free throw line. A pair for Weber, 35 to 29. Sauer, Weems, Lee, Madsen, and Seaton, the lineup for the Cardinal. Into the final minute we go, the first half. Near steal there. Seaton controlled. Arthur Lee lets it fly over McCravey, and that's an air ball. Seaton going up his foul. I think Lee was actually looking for the foul right there, and he didn't get it. He's a little surprised by it. But again, you see the inside power of the Cardinal of Stanford. Even though they missed the shot badly, they're able to get the rebound. Danny Johnson picked up the foul. Well, they can go three deep to somebody like Mark Seaton, a 6'9 junior. Looks bigger than that. In Cypress, California. And all of that muscle they have and height. And the likes of Madsen and Young. Mendez at 6'7. Van Ellswick at 6'9. Jaron Collins at 6'9. They are just huge. 35 to 29. Man to man for Stanford. Carl Thomas feeding inside. And that is 
Danny Johnson going to the glass. Boy, Johnson showed you his leaping ability right there again. He's now got seven points, but he just took it up over top. Mike Montgomery complaining he felt that Johnson committed him charging foul in there as Weems went to the deck. He takes a timeout with 24 seconds remaining and a four-point lead. Let's take a look at the east bracket in Hartford, Connecticut, where Carolina advanced with their victory over Navy yesterday, as did UNC Charlotte. So you've got a little uh, interstate rivalry happening there next. One against eight. And how about Princeton, Dan? Uh, that victory over UNLV. Bill Baino, the running Rebs coach, gave them great credit afterwards. They'll meet Michigan State next, but he said they are just flat out a good team. Forget all of the stuff about systems and so on. He said those guys can play. Well, they sure can play. The interesting game, of course, Princeton's always interesting, but North Carolina against North Carolina Charlotte, those teams in the same state, 125 miles apart, they've never played. They may have to shut down the state of North Carolina so everybody can watch that one on TV. <laughs> Final seconds here of the first half. Lee and Weems, the backcourt for the Cardinal now. Playing for the final shot. Here goes Lee. Lee works his way in. The spinner won't go for him. It's rebounded, and that's going to be well short. The long shot from Carl Thomas. Well, you got to feel that Charleston is leaving here at halftime down by four, and the way they shot, uh, they got to think, hey, they've got a chance uh, in this game. We've got a Charleston player down on the floor at the under the basket. That is Carlos Brown injured on the final play of the game. Getting some attention there. And so it's a four-point game. Let's go to Jimmy Dykes with Mike Montgomery. Uh, very sporadic. We're not defending anybody, you know. They're setting back screens, and we're getting caught on the screens. They're getting way too good of shots for what they should get. Offensively, they got us out of sync a little bit, but we should be able to dominate the boards. We just got to play better in the second half. Thanks, Coach. Tim? Okay, Jimmy. Uh, Mike Montgomery uh, telling it as it is at the end of the first half with a score, Stanford 35, College of Charleston 31. CBS Sports exclusive coverage. And the men's NCAA basketball championship continues after this message and a word from your local station. At halftime of the game between College of Charleston and Stanford, but there's all kinds of other good stuff going on, and we'll tell you about it. CBS Sports presents Pennzoil at the Half, sponsored by Pennzoil, specially formulated for today's stop and go driving. Stop, go, Pennzoil. Welcome to Pennzoil at the Half, everyone. Greg Dumble along with Clark Kellogg and Dean Smith at halftime. 35-31, the Stanford Cardinal down early, four-point lead at halftime. Doing work in the paint. They've got a huge size advantage, the way Charleston has been able to stay in it, using their quickness to get open court opportunities. Everything is points in the paint to you, isn't it? I mean, that's a big factor when you've got a seven-footer over there on your side. <laughs> big fellas do it all the time. defense. It really is good. <laughs> all right, elsewhere in the Midwest, first-round action in Oklahoma City. Florida State and TCU, the Horned Frogs with a one-point lead. 3.45 to play first quarter. Let's take you out there live and see what's happening. Ted Robinson and Rolando Blackman with the call. Well, in Oklahoma City, the fifth seed TCU Horned Frogs having a battle with the Florida State Seminoles, the 12th seed. TCU now up by three. And uh, Florida State been weakened now with the loss of their point guard, Kerry Thompson, who suffered a back injury. He's standing on the sideline being tended to. Meanwhile, TCU's Lee Nalen now opens up a five-point lead. And uh, Florida State does not really have a strong backup point guard as Ron Hale tips one in. Right now, TCU getting their game going, moving up and down the court, getting the basketball to their scores, as well as some good play inside by Dennis Davis with some nice putbacks. Matt Klebeck, a freshman walk-on, is going to try to fill the role of Kerry Thompson for Florida State. Mike Jones missing, and Ron Hales clears it. The Seminoles have played awfully well in this first half, but their backup point guard walked off the team just before the ACC tournament. So with Kerry Thompson out, they're really going to struggle at that position against TCU. The Horned Frogs, 97 points a game, the leading, scorer in, uh, leading scoring team in the nation, as Lewis answers for Florida State. The Seminoles, a team that had a great... So that's what's taking place in Oklahoma City and Florida State down one to TCU 44 to 43, two and a half to play in the first half. Meanwhile, at the Georgia Dome in Atlanta, St. Louis and UMass, and it's the Billikens with a five-point lead. Let's join Jim Nance and Billy Packers. St. Louis led by two at halftime, now with a five-point advantage. Larry Hughes with six points. Bruiser Flint's team 
the seventh seed in the South, led by three in the first half. Knocked off last year in the first round by Louisville in the NCAA tournament. Louisville went on to the final eight before being demolished by North Carolina. And a foul ball on Oh, Kentner better be careful as well. Now, he is so frustrated, Jim. The ball is coming into the low post. As soon as it touches his hands, watch the double team coming in from outside. And he's trying to use his upper body here. See that? To gain position. He just is not patient in the inside. He's content to catch and try to score. His night, night, second personal. Nice piece of officiating not to call the technical on him. Too close a game for that. The referee was, uh, had some patience of his own. There was the screen that time for Hughes, but Babel is right there. He fights through screens. He fights over screens. Inside underneath, and Hughes is hacked. So a couple of teams that come into this tournament 21 and 10, St. Louis with a five-point lead and uh, just under 13 minutes to play in the second half. At the Rupp Arena in Lexington, Kentucky, they're just underway in the second half. New Mexico leading Butler 33-24. Tim Brando and Al McGuire are there. New Mexico claiming its largest lead of the game to open this second half. Foul spotted inside no, off the ball. This is a game in which uh, Butler got out to an early lead. Early foul difficulty for Kenny Thomas put him on the bench. But Barry Collier's big man, John Newhauser, last year's MCC Player of the Year, a non-factor, 0 for 5 from the floor, and benched since the last goal, five minutes of the first half, and did not start to open the second. Now Baum and Marshall get tied up. The arrow is to New Mexico. The Lobos coming in, a fourth seed. Butler, the 13th seed out of the Midwestern Collegiate Conference. Here's a real scramble with two huge bodies going to the floor. They look like they belong in wrestling more than basketball. Butler and New Mexico. New Mexico 17-0 when they lead at halftime this season. They led in the first half here, and they maintain that lead early in the second half. Now, earlier today in Oklahoma City, a one-pointer. Valparaiso over Ole Miss, 70-69. It was 69-67 Mississippi. Valpo coach Homer Drew looking for a miracle. It's to Jenkins, to Drew for the win. Gone. He did it. A miracle. It's a play bet that we run over and over in practice constantly, and usually never a season do you have a chance to run it. We call it Pacer because we kind of learned it from the Indianapolis Pacer years ago. So it is a set play, and Jamie Sykes made a great pass. Bill Jenkins made a great catch, and then a good pass, and then Bryce, what an awesome shot. Uh, you know, just very proud for our team. How many times have you and Bryce played out that very scenario in the backyard? We do have a court in the backyard, and we have hit that shot over and over again. It was just wonderful to see Bryce finally get to show everyone else that he can hit that shot. Our right, congratulations, Homer. Best of luck in the second round. Thanks very much, Beth. You know, Coach, we toss the term miracle around <laughs> loosely sometimes, but it took not one, not two, three perfect plays to get that winning basket. It really basket. did. The pass, the catch, and the play itself. It's like the Hoosiers mo movie. It's really better the way it land, uh, ended, and I felt so sorry for uh, Mississippi. They did, really played well and missed those foul shots. And Dennis Hopper hopping up and down in the bed, too. <laughs> in uh, Rupp Arena in Lexington earlier today, first round action in the South, Iona fell to Syracuse 63-61. This, too, a terrific ending to a great game. With under 30 seconds remaining in regulation, the Gales down two, senior John McDonald in traffic throws up a three. Iona, a one-point lead, and it led to the by two and uh, we have second half action coming up for you from the United Center in Chicago we will get to that right after this stay with us Pennzoil at the half has been sponsored by Pennzoil specially formulated for today's stop-and-go drive